boys and girls, Doug Childs here. It's Warriors Rich and Wild Man. What's happening, Doug? Hey, man, I'm, I'm doing a new painting right now. It's a Benaya in a pit during a snowy day killing a lion. And um, yeah. yeah, so I've got the I've got the spear. So I don't know if I've sent you a picture of this, but Benaya is is jumping up from a off a ledge coming down on the lion and the lion splayed out screaming with his paws up in the air and he's kind of standing on his hind legs and Benai is ramming a spear from the back of his head out of his mouth. So that's what I'm talking about. That's what I do. That's what I do, Rich. You know me. I haven't seen that one, huh? Yeah. I've kind of keeping on the down low cause uh, painting snow, man, that's just, you got to just set the stage. You got to get everything and then, man, when you go in with the, the, my representation of the snow, it feels like you're just ruining the whole damn painting. So you've got the thing completely, fully uh, executed, and then you just start slinging, you know, white and gray paint on top of the canvas. Some of it's uh, specific. Some of it's random. And, man, I'm telling you, uh, I probably put in, I don't know, about 20 hours uh, till I got to the snow level, and then when the... <laughs> I was like, I'm ruining this painting, but I continued on. And Rich, I think I think I'm going to pull it out. I think it's going to work, man. So, yeah, man, I'm looking forward to seeing it. It sounds cool. Hey, uh, speaking of cool, uh, I think some of the greatest books that are out there uh, in regards to Christendom, definitely if you're a uh, Protestant, are the Puritan classics. And Banner Truth has been nothing but a storehouse of preserving the great Puritan authors. And uh, Thomas Manton is, is one of my favorite, and he's got this little book called All Things for the Good. Now, I gifted myself the whole collection of the Puritan classics a couple months ago for light summer beach reading, you know. And uh, so I get I get into this little book, and I was like, all right, let's see what they have to say about a very familiar passage. Dude, it blew my mind. I told Regis the other day, we we're sitting and talking, having a cigar and stuff. I go, this is one of the most important books I've ever read in my life. So wow. it's it's up there in the top 10. Rich, it could be in the Doug Giles Library in the top five. So rich. It's typical Puritan type stuff. You know, so the Puritans, for those who are not hip to them and think that they were just these, you know, buck, <clears throat> these buckle shoed killjoys <coughs> that just went around burning witches and banning stuff. That's a that's that's the left's version of them. That's a caricature. That's a cartoon. Right. These guys were uh, deeply uh, well read in the scripture. You got this guy named William Gurnall, who's a, a great Puritan author. So he takes Ephesians um, six ten through eighteen about the armor of God. So you're talking eight verses, right? You know how many pages he wrote on eight verses in Ephesians six ten through eighteen? How many? Take a take a wild stab, man. Go nuts. 200, 264. Yeah, try, I think it's 1,200 pages in the uh, in the unabridged. Whoa. Yeah, just deep water, man, deep water. And, uh, you know, the reason they could do stuff like that is that they didn't have social media back then in the 17th right. century. So anyway, Matton, uh, he's got, he takes the, the well-known verse that everybody says, you know, um, in Romans 8, 28, it's the it's the theme, Rich, of every Christian song known to mankind, and it's rich and it's good, but the way that Manson milks uh, that verse is just out of this world. So for those who are not hip to Romans 8, 28, uh, Paul says, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. So if you've been to church that it's John three sixteen, <laughs> and Romans yeah. eight and Romans eight twenty eight and Manton. <laughs> yeah, with, with good reason. With good reason, right? Yeah, they're, it's 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 delightful. But again, you know, any when people tell me, Rich, like, ah, you know, I don't get much out of the Bible. It's like you're just stupid, man. Because yeah, there's, well, the there's a there's a time to pay attention. Yeah. To yeah, there's 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 a lot of gold in them thar hills if you'll uh, if you'll mine it. And that's what again, that's why I dig about. Uh, the Puritan authors, in contrast, you know, to, uh, you know, our contemporaries is that. Well, Doug, I think it's important uh, to bring this up about the Bible and also about reading books like this. A friend of mine told me years ago 
He said, um, I have a problem. I don't care about people. He said, I know it's a problem. I feel bad about it, but I just don't care. And I said, if you see a car accident and the car's rolled over and there's people there helping, what do you do? He said, slow down and get annoyed and wait till I get by and drive by. Right. Complained right. complain it, it held him up in traffic. Right. But if you see a car upside down, there's nobody there and you go over there and you see some young woman trapped in there and she's hurt. I said, how much would you care then? He said, oh, man, I would do everything. I said, yeah, that's the problem with your life with people is that you have to slow down. And if you do that with the Bible and if you do it with books like this and you read it and you slow down, you'll find that the proper emotions and the, the proper thought processes are going to come into into play. That's It's not something that you glance at in between something you're not really paying attention to on your Netflix binge. Like you have to take the time. And if you sit down and take the time, you'll get the learning, you'll get the understanding, you get the revelation, you get the presence of God and all those things that come with it. But you got to slow down. Yeah. And, uh, and Rich, you know, before I ever got into the ministry, you know, because everybody thinks, you know, if you know, well, pastors have to do it because they're getting paid for it. Man, I was I was doing that from the get go from, you know, when I came you know, screaming and yelling out of the womb of the Holy Spirit, uh, I, I had a hunger for the word. And I think if people don't have, you know, if a baby in the natural realm, if it ain't hungry for mommy's titty milk, then it's either sick or it's dying, you know, or it's dead. Yeah. yeah. And I, I, I again, man, I don't I don't get it at all. Or I do get it, Rich, that there's mm-hmm. something definitely wrong with the Christian where their Bible collects dust, where it's not revelatory, where it's not faith building, where it's not uh, a magnet to attract them, you know, to the uh, to the wisdom and the counsel of God. I think I think you're sick, man. There's something wrong with you. You definitely Charles Finney would say, "Ooh, that's a sign of being backslidden. And um, the Puritans. Yeah, absolutely. The Puritans wouldn't even get it. They would say that the person is uh, unconverted if they don't care about, you know, God's uh, precious and magnificent promises. They're definitely they're definitely uh, <laughs> getting the life choked out out of them by El Diablo if they're away from the scripture. Anyway, then it's not, again, just for the preachers, man. It's for everybody. So Manton, right. Manton, in regards to this uh, this verse again, that we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God and those who are called according to his purpose. He said, <laughs> he said, dear Christian reader, there are two things which I have always looked upon as difficult. The one is to make the wicked sad and the other is to make the godly joyful. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's like, uh, you know, I can't get the wicked to frickin' feel anything and get them to uh, uh, take note of, uh, you know, their poor, right. condemned and damned condition. And then also, I can't get the godly to get joyful about God being on their side. Exactly. So he said dejection in the godly arises from a double spring, either because of their inward comforts are darkened or their outward comforts comforts are disturbed. And he said to cure mm-hmm. both of these troubles, I've put forth this ensuing treaties, hoping by the blessing of God that it will buoy up their desponding hearts and make them look with a more pleasant aspect. That's so good. And so the prescription, yeah, so good. when you're going through the meat grinder, because again, you know, uh, when, when our passions run high, when we get emotional, we get a big downturn, we get horrible news, whatever. We we look at that verse and say, yeah, that's that's a bunch of crap because I can't see anything right now that's good that's going to come out of my current local condition. Are you there, Rich? Oh yeah. Yeah, I'm reading I'm just reading it also. He said, uh, uh, to know that nothing hurts the godly. Nothing hurts the godly. That's a manner of comfort. So whatever gets thrown into our court, whatever Satan serves us or whatever we do to our own selves, or if God puts us through, uh, I don't know, an interesting time in the wilderness, 
uh, nothing that occurs to the godly, those who love God. And again, it's particular. And, and Manton points it out in this book, All Things for the Good. He said, if you love God and you're called according to his purpose, so it's it's particular who this promise is for. It's right. not to everybody. God's not, you know, eh, everything's going to be all right. It'll come out in the wash. This is not a willy nilly promise. This is to his covenant kids. This is to those who are called, following his purpose, called to his purpose. God says whatever bad crap happens in your life, and it could be really bad, uh, it's, all, it's, it's all going to be fine. Uh, and it could take you know, 10 or 20 years to see the wisdom, to see the, the grace and the mercy of God through that thing, through that loss, through right. whatever bad crap happens to you. But he holds up this promise in this massive way. I mean, you look at dudes like Joseph. It's like, I'm going to be the multicolored favored son of my father and my mom and dad and all you dunderhead siblings of mine. You're all going to bow down to me. And he was right. But the path that God took him, man, none of that from a fleshly standpoint is good. You get a vision and then you get sold into slavery. Not good. Right. Uh, from slavery, you bounce into prison, being accused of rape, not good. And then what happens, right. Rich? You know, so we're talking about a spate of what, uh, 13 years, something like that with Joseph? Yeah, yeah, 13 years. They figured 13 to 14 years. That's insane. Yeah, and what I think is the perspective that Joseph has that echoes, you know, what Paul's saying here in Romans 8:28, uh, when he finally sees his brother and they start their brothers and they start freaking out, thinking that he's going to have him murdered. He said, "You meant it for evil, but God meant it for right. good." Now, what kind of Christian, Rich, has that kind of uh, perspicuity that they can look at all the bad stuff that happened to them and and say, "Listen, what what you meant for evil." Again, he had evil done to him. It wasn't just, you know, right. it wasn't evil wasn't light. Fault. Yeah. And uh, and he said, he said, uh, God, God allowed it to happen. Well, that's that's some clarity. You, uh, that's some clarity, big dog. When when I was was in another country and a pastor that we didn't get along that much and he was preaching, he was actually teaching on this verse. And I was like, OK, I'm in the teaching was fine. It wasn't. Anything spectacular. It wasn't bad. It was good. You know, it's Bible stuff. It's okay. But then at the end, he tells a story, though, that him and his wife were at a ministry meeting and they came back late. And these guys had broken into their house and their daughter had their fr two friends spending the night. I think it was two friends. And they were gang raped by this group of people in another country. Okay. And. So I'm, I'm listening to this and I'm, I'm sitting there thinking, OK, this guy's pretty awesome. I changed my mind. And he said, well. We didn't know what to do, so we sat down because I asked a question. They asked, you could ask questions during the conference. And I said, how did you get over the desire for wrath and revenge? And he said, I sat down with my family and our verse had always been all things work together for good for those who love God and they're called according to his purposes. And so as a family, we all agreed that we would hold on to that verse and live it. Yeah. Bro. Then they show a video of his daughter preaching at this massive conference. She's a trauma counselor, married, kids, happy, powerful, because she refused to be a victim. But just what we're talking about here. And so we, you know, sometimes we see a story about Joseph and we go, ah, oh, Joseph, you know, and then you put it in modern times, you know, you imagine a young teenage girl, 14, 14 or 15 years old, I can't remember, who's a virgin, just gang raped. And couldn't even imagine that, like happening in your family, but then the family together saying, we are going to live this verse, God has a plan. Yeah, and again, you you know, it comes uh, uh, screaming by inspiration of the Holy Spirit through the lips of the Apostle Paul, who got the shiitake mushrooms beat out of him right. to disfigurement levels. So this is not some airy fairy crap, you know. This this stuff uh, it works in the mud. It's four wheel drive type promises, and like you said, with with that uh, that 
poor girl that gets gang raped and she's like, this is not going to define me. I'm not going to become a victim over this. I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to get some beauty out of these ashes. And <clears throat> Manson brings out when he starts to unravel uh, this, this text in his glorious way. And he said, he said, the first thing that he starts focusing on in uh, doing his exposition of, of Romans eight, he said, we know that all things work together for the good, for those who love God and called according to his purpose. So he said, there's a certainty of the privilege. So when the bad stuff happens to us, we know that is not a matter of wavering. That's not a matter of doubt. He's not saying we hope or we conjecture. Paul said that we as believers, we know God's going to redeem us from whatever squalid crap that just slapped our lives. Do you find do you find in pastoring rich that that most Christians uh, have that level of confidence where they're not just hoping, they're not just wishing, they're not just like, oh, well, some, maybe this will happen. Do they have a knowing like, OK, Satan, you just did this to me. Uh, you hit my health. You hit my wealth. You hit me here in a sin issue or you attack my business or whatever. I know God's going to come in here. Can't see it, but I know he's going to come in here and he's going to redeem it. And whatever was bad, whatever is evil, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that uh, it's going to be evident and infallible that God's going to turn this on Satan's noggin and make him rue the day that he ever messed with me. Right, exactly. But, you know, like you said, um, you know, do people know, like the people that I know, everyone that I know, myself included sometimes, you know, you would say it, you wouldn't question it, you would believe that it's true. But then in the practical application of it, it's almost like I don't know anything about that or believe it to be true, if that makes sense. Like this, all things work together for good. Okay, yeah, got it. But then I'm going to go live like I don't believe that or I'm not trusting that that's the answer. Yeah, and I think you know what uh, I'm talking about? I've been I've been like that. Oh, dude, I've I've spent <laughs> years in the fog of that. But here's the thing is that, you know, going back to the whole, you know, people not reading the scripture, people not, you know, mining the gold that's in there, not, you know, looking at these promises as is uh and, and all these narratives that are in the Old Testament that these are for me. This is not just a story about David. This is not just a story about Joseph. This ain't, you know, just Hannah's problems or Esther's and stuff. You know, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10 and Romans 15, what happened to them, that's for you. And yeah. so and so when people have, you know, uh, uh, ignorance of this and they're not saturated in these these horrible things that God allowed, you know, his people to go through uh, collectively and personally, then then they don't have any kind of uh, faith. They don't have the knowing. They don't have the revelation. And so they're, you know, if Satan hit them, he's got them again in this hopeless, you know, morass of despondency. Yeah. And um, sure, they'll go to heaven, but you've got to you've got to cling to this stuff when when the crap's hitting the fan. And, um, you know, Paul, when he wrote to the church in Rome, they're undergoing persecution, grave persecution by Caesar. And he's saying, we know that all this crap that's going on yeah. right now is going to work for our good. And so that level of certainty, man, and again, I know I'm talking about the Apostle Paul, but um, if that dude can have it going through what he went through, I think, Rich, we should have, I don't know, a scintilla yeah. of it if we're going over molehills in the Garden of Eden. Absolutely. And, and you know, I think this is a good time to really bring in, for me, to clarify it in my mind and maybe some of the listeners, like the chair analogy is when you have faith in a chair, I mean, you see a chair that you've sat in many times, you don't even think about it. You just sit in the chair. You've sat in it before. Even a chair you've never sat in before, you look at it and like, that's a chair, it looks good, I'm sitting in it. And you sit in it, once you sit in it, you just don't think about it anymore. And I think the problem for me personally is that I, when you sit in the chair, you're resting and you're not any longer sitting there wondering if the chair is going to hold you up. But I think sometimes 
I'll think this verse or I'll pray and believe this verse and say all things work together for good. For those who love God, I'm like, that's me. I got it in my head. But then I don't sit in that confidence and rest in it. I'm still manipulating it and working it and trying to have my input on how I think it should work out, if that right. makes sense. Like, yeah. I, I want to be able to say, man, I sit in that. Not, not I want to. I'm going to. I mean, talking about this today, I know I need to. But I don't sit and rest in the confidence of this verse in the knowing and the trusting but I'm sitting in the chair anxiously wondering the whole time. And that, that's not what this guy's talking about in the book. And that's not what the apostle Paul was talking about. Yeah. It's not what they experienced either. Um, right. I mean, all the stuff that happened to Paul ended in his decapitation. So there was, there was this, um, there was this level of contentment and trust in God that, okay, so this is some bad crap going down. And you look at Joseph, you know, he's sitting in the chair and he's not liking uh, the pit He's not liking the prison. He's he's working angles right. with the with the baker and the butler. And God's like, no, I'm going to bring you to the zero point. It's not going to be the baker. It's not going to be the butler. It's not going to be any of your connections. I'm not looking for your right. ingenuity. I'm not looking for your your help or your scheme, how to get you out of this crap sling. I'll do it in my good timing. And bro, how long do you have to be a Christian, man, before you get to that kind of level of uh, submission and patience, you know, to the plan of God when it's making your yeah. freaking hair fall out and you don't understand anything? And the only thing you got is, you know, he is going to work this for the good. And again, nothing looks like good. I mean, the story right. that so you sent me a picture and we've talked about it uh, before, but it's worth uh, regaling the Warriors and Wild Men audience with before we close. You sent me a picture last week of frickin' Levi preaching. And yeah, oh my son. God, dude. I was like, I was on the verge of uh, hysterical laughter and tears. Because, yeah. uh, you know, we walked through that. I know, obviously, uh, you're on the front lines of that battle. But all the stuff that he went through uh, when when he for a time period, short time period, thank God that he uh, kind of fell away from his faith or jumped away from his faith. <laughs> and then yeah. can you, Rich, can you imagine uh, God the Father looking at Levi, his son? Can you imagine all the holy angels sitting there looking at him when he was in the throes of rebellion? And I'm not going to take it. I'm not going to listen to my dad. I'm going to do my own thing. And they're like, I'll give you five years, boy, and you're going to be preaching the gospel in front of couple thousand yeah, people it was, it was even <laughs> less than that right <laughs> that's that's the yeah. you know for kids all things work together for the good man that i think you know that's where parents have got to get you know that confidence level up i remember when hannah was kind of into some sketchy stuff and it wasn't drugs or sex she was just loitering you know hanging out with surfers uh yeah. you know it's like she's got so much more than this going on and Mary Margaret is like, hey, man, we got to pray. We've got to pray two o'clock in the morning. And I came to a place of faith, Rich, and um, uh, out of Philippians 4, it's like cast your burdens on on Christ. He'll carry them. Yeah. And um, I stopped praying for her. And she's like, what, what are you doing? It's like, God's carrying this. I'm not carrying it. I'm casting it on him. He's He's got the shoulders that can bear this. I can. I'm going to get alopecia if I keep thinking about yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> and then next thing you know, Rich, I think it was six months later, uh, she's taking Obama's claim to fame, Acorn, down to Chinatown on April Fool's Day and saving the nation $8.5 billion. And it was inspired, that sting up, by the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Boom. Come on, man. Just like that. And that's that's the grace of God, man. That's what we're trusting in, right? That's the promise. That's what we should rest in. And it's it's interesting because I, I remember I talked to you about this, but Hebrews eleven two. This is when I got the victory with my kids. Um, Hebrews eleven one. Faith is the substance of things hoped hope for, the evidence of things not seen. Verse two. For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. And I looked that up and studied that, and I couldn't believe how many commentaries I read about that part that nobody talks about. And it was saying that the elders, talking about Abraham, all the, the heroes of the faith, they received a good report 
or a good testimony or it was said about them, you did a good job. You know why? Because they believed for things that never even happened in their lifetime. So they were commended for believing when they believed for a promise that they were never going to see in their lifetime. And so when I saw that, I, I started understanding from the commentaries that they started living according to those promises being true. And that's what you're saying. Well, I don't even need to pray. I know this is going to happen. And when I, I got think that I, promise to my kids, I kept praying for them, but I literally, I knew, and I know now I still have, you know, one wayward kid, but I know now, but I'll tell you what, when Levi came back to the Lord, it was so fast after I got that revelation that it blew my mind. I, it was almost like, it's not, like, this can't even be this real. It can't be that fast. And it is that real. And that's the confidence. And so like we we're talking about that all things work together for good. I want to have that confidence in all things, not yeah. just in specific things sometimes. Right. Because you know, there's various for my kids. Right. There's various things that uh, life's going to toss at you. And it, and, and like you said, it, it doesn't just extend to the offspring. I mean, the, it's uh, the, the war that we face, the challenges that we face, especially in this frickin perverted and adulterous generation in the radical Marxist takeover. It's multifaceted. It's deep. There's a bunch of different fronts that we're staring at. You know, if you look at America, you look at what's going on frickin Yuma in our southern borders like. How the hell is this going to be good? What's where's the good in any of this stuff? We're being invaded, right? right. And yet we still got to, you know, if we're a believer, we're like, Lord, I don't, <laughs> man, this is beyond, uh, this is beyond my uh, uh, limited sight. I'm seeing through a glass darkly right now on this, you know. But right. you said all things work together for the good, so. That's what I'm going to stick to, because if we get to a place where we're just doubting and we're wavering and we don't know that God providentially rules in the affairs of mankind and that what he does, you know, on this on this great blue marble uh, is will enact his glory and his good and the honor of his son. Then what are we doing here? I mean, we're right. we're ineffective. We're you know, we're. It's all chance. It's up to chaos to define. It's like, no, it's not. Not if you're a believer. So everything that's that's bad, whether it's personally, uh, whether it's a, a stratagem of Satan, whether it's some freaking, you know, cabal uh, deep state inside the beltway. I don't know how God's going to whoop the devil's ass, but I know he's going to do it. He said he's going to do it. And everything right. that looks like is stacked completely against the Christian in the body of Christ, personally and corporately. God says, uh, no, I'm going to have the last laugh on this uh, on this altercation. And it might not be in your time frame, like you said, <clears throat> but it's up to us to, uh, again, to live uh, the promise, to believe the promise, to expect right. the promise of God, you know, uh, turning all things into good. For those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Yeah, and, and I'll tell you what. I, yeah, I agree 100 percent. And Annie's reading has been reading some stuff by Elizabeth Elliot for a while. And uh, man, what a powerful woman of faith. One of the things that she was teaching me about was that Elizabeth Elliot said she made up her mind. I'm going to receive every cup that the Lord offers. me. I'm just going to take it. Jesus did, and I'm going to take it. Whatever's in the cup, I'll take it. Was that and, prior? Uh, was that prior to Jim uh, being killed by the no, Marcus? That's after, bro. That's after. Wow. And uh, yeah, and so you know, her yeah, as you were saying, her husband was killed by the Alka Indians. He was a martyr, you know, for the faith, and she cut the hair of the men that killed her husband, you know, and won those people to Jesus, but. Um, she said, I, I just determined I'm going to receive the cup, whatever's in it. I'm going to receive it from the Lord. And we were in Philippines and I was going to go on this dive training thing. And I went and had to get my lungs x-rayed because of how bad I had COVID and all that stuff. But, um, I laid in bed and I was thinking, man, cause I really love diving. I've been diving for years and years and years. And I laid in bed and I had to deal with the fact that I might never be able to dive again. 
Because your lungs, I mean, obviously that's a big deal, but it's a bigger deal when it's under pressure and different gases and stuff underwater. And so I laid in bed and I was pretty upset. And then I thought, Lord, whatever's in the cup, I'm going to receive it. And I literally, not in a way that I didn't have faith, but I literally just kind of let it die. Right. I was like, man, <clears throat> Lord, if that's, you know, fine, you're keeping me from getting hurt or even dead. And if that's what you want, I won't do it. And so guess what? I'm fine. And I'm able to dive and I've been diving and my, my lungs are great. They actually feel better than ever. So I have zero problems. I'm thankful. My x-rays don't really agree with that, um, but that's okay. Um, Jesus agrees with it and my lungs feel fantastic. But I'll tell you what, man, when it's something that you love a lot, you just receive it. You're like, God, what do you have for my life? What's your plan? And and maybe it's not as trivial as a hobby, you know? Yeah. Whatever it is. You just receive the cup, man, and, and believe. Because that really is the basis, right? God, whatever you're giving me, I'm believing that it's going to work out for good, for your purpose. And when your purpose is my purpose, then for sure my purpose is going to be accomplished if it's your purpose. It's impossible that it's not, right? Yeah, and I, I like the specificity that, that Manton puts upon, uh, you know, the here in regards to uh, all things working for the goods. Like, if you love God, then it's going gonna, it's gonna to be fine. It's going to be good. And good is defined by God and not Netflix. Um, yeah, that's and right. I, and I think, you know, a lot of Christians, I think they love, you know, God's hand. I think they love his stuff. I think they love, you know, what— is afforded in the perks of being his covenant kid. But I don't know if they really love God for who God is. Yeah. He's a righteous God. He's a holy God. He's he's your Lord. He's your king. And you know, when we're when we're thinking, it's like, but but I like the stuff that he gives. It's like, right. well then then the stuff that you're going through might not work for your good. Until you get back to that love route, that love relationship that you had with Christ when you initially right. met him, you know. And again, uh, are you following his purpose? The stuff that's coming into your life that might mm -hmm. seem bad and evil, it's because you're way freaking off course, man. You're, <laughs> right. you, aren't, you aren't chasing down, you know, his call. You're not chasing down uh, the reason why he drafted you in, into this incredible holy army you know you're out there in freaking left field or you're not even in the stadium and so the the good aspect is when you know our hearts realign just like you said it's like lord if i don't scuba dive say la vie okay there's there's right. other things <laughs> that you could be doing in me and through me and at the end of the day i'm yours okay and so these other things that we think are supposed to follow us all the days of our life that we want to enjoy that there's no sin in it whatsoever, but God, you know, kind of like with Abraham's, like, give me your boy. I want to see if you'll sacrifice that. Right. And most most Christians, are like, hell no, man, you ain't getting you ain't getting my promise. And uh, yeah, and that that's part of it is sometimes it's getting your head, your heart engaged, and then your head around it. You know, we need to obey. And uh, I like what Tony Evans he was talking about actually forgiving people. He said you don't have to pray about forgiving people. You're commanded to forgive. Don't pray about things you're commanded to do. He said you could pray on the way to go do it. But I think that's a good example for a lot of things. It's like, well, God's told me to do this. Well, don't try to get your head around it. Engage your heart and ask the Lord to help you get your head around it as you follow what he asks you to do and obey. Yeah, and the only way you can do that, man, is that you just have to spend time alone with him. And all these, all these bad things— uh, you look at the stuff that Joseph, again, in particular, the bad stuff that was going to him, and he has, uh, you know, this this hot married woman come on to him. Like right. most Christians I know, it's like, eh, screw it. You know, they would jump in the sack with her. But Joseph, when he's having all this bad stuff happen, he's still in love with God. And he's like, how can I sin against God? I'm not going to do this. I have the opportunity. Right. Probably nobody would see it. I've got desperate housewives of Egypt, you know, uh, bearing down my neck. The Lord will forgive me if I do it. And he's like, no, I'm still in love. I'm still trusting that all this bad crap is going to be for good. 
and that, yeah, I'm not going to play Pokemon with this chick. Right. That's somebody yeah, that's, who, tough, man. That's, that's somebody who has a relationship with God, and it's not some perfunctory thing that they do on Sundays. Exactly. Exactly. And I think on a teaching like this, I, I have a hard time with people who are like, oh, yeah, I already know that. You know, it's like there's levels to this game, man. That's a famous saying, you know, well, there's levels to this, too. Like I'm saying, man, I want to I want to think like that. I want to live and believe like that in all situations, not just in some, not just in key moments. I want to be like that where I'm trusting that God's will is being <clears throat> accomplished. Right. When we don't know up from down and we're more confused than a termite and a yo-yo. Uh, I can't, yeah. I can't, uh, I can't, what's the word I'm looking for, Rich? I can't push this book enough on the Warriors and Wildmen uh, listener. All Things for the Good by Thomas Manton. And you can get it, uh, Banner of Truth. I think it's on Amazon also. Incredible book. Very deep. It's going to, <laughs> it's going to challenge you. Ooh, Rich. It's going to challenge your faith. It's going to challenge your I'll love. Get it and start reading it right away. It's going to challenge uh, whether you are, you know, following his purpose. Because again, this is particular. All things work together for the good of those who love God, and they're called according to His purpose. That's who yeah. the promise pertains to. Nobody else. Yeah, I love it, man. All right, bud. Powerful. All right, Mission Man, let's uh, let's get Radu on if he can do it in a uh, couple of weeks before you split back to the United States of liberal acrimony. Until then, <laughs> in the meantime, Rich, and in the in-between time, what should the Warrior and Wild Men listener do? Well, they definitely need to go to warriorsandwildmen.com, subscribe, it's free. We'll hit you up with a couple emails a week, let you know what's going on, keep you posted. And if you want to help support the ministry, keep this thing going, uh, go to the War Chest, donate. Uh, it's tax deductible. We'll send you the information on that when you send your gift. For those that are doing it, you guys rock. You're making it happen. Warriors and Wildman, out. Mm-hmm.